technique, uh, then 3D printing is the way that we do these things. Uh, so traditional manufacturing, there's a lot of different things about traditional manufacturing. I'm not going to worry too much about that now. Uh, 3D printing, as it is now, like I said, it's still in its infancy and there are some limits. Um, a 3D printed part is still not as good as a manufactured part, even if it's made out of the same materials. Uh, and we'll talk about how it works in a little while, but I don't have any destructive examples with me. I should print a new, here, I'll print new gears at some point. This is a 3D printed set of gears, uh, and the gears themselves, I don't know if this will, I can pull this off with the thread or not, but yeah. the gears themselves are basically garbage, right? I mean, they'll last for a little while, but the material is not great compared to a production molded piece of material, even if it's the same plastic that's, that's used to make it. Uh, the stuff is more fragile, it's lower resolution, it's more expensive, it takes longer to produce. Uh, it needs specialized equipment, expensive com equipment compared to the kind of equipment that you would get to make traditional things. It needs a 3D printed design file. You have to design anything that comes out of the 3D printer, you have to have a computer model that's going to make it. Right? Traditional manufacturing, you don't actually need a computer model. You can model something out of clay and then do a series of transfers to have a full production model. But with, with 3D printing, you have to have a computer model of that, and that can be a challenge. About the size of a loaf of bread. So a 3D printer can make anything, as long as it's made out of plastic, and about the size of a loaf of bread, or smaller. <clears throat> um, but one of the things that we talk about with 3D printing is not just that it, it has these uh, limitations, but also these possibilities. It also has the potential to completely undermine many of our economic models. Uh, because when somebody can print something at their house, even if it's more expensive than making one off the shelf, if they can print it and personalize it themselves, that has significant value. Right? It's cheaper doing that than having it, you know, think about the amount of shipping that's involved in, in manufacturing thermoplastic like ABS and then getting it to you. So you have to extract oil from somewhere, that's dirty. And then you have to send that oil to a refinery, and that takes time and transportation. Then you have to take that refined product to another factory where you get it into pellets. And you take it from the pellets to you take the, to the manufacturing plant, and then from the manufacturing plant you get it to the production plant, and then from the production plant. So it's going back and forth around the world five or six times, right? Uh, and that's really expensive. If you could just make one kind of a product, like a raw material, and ship it to everybody, not only is that shipping cheaper, because it doesn't have to be as good, right? The shipping can be, when you ship a final part like this, you have to protect it. You know, you have to wrap it in, in, in plastic and, and wrap it in packing material so it doesn't break on its way. But if it's raw materials, I didn't bring any of the raw material, but if it's just raw materials, it doesn't have to be protected as well when it's shipped. So there's a lot of significant changes that may happen. We already talked about the difference between um, mass-produced things versus bespoke things. Uh, in traditional manufacturing, you can still get bespoke stuff, but it's incredibly expensive. With 3D printing, that will change as well. Uh, so 3D printing means that things can exist that are both inexpensive and non-commodity, uh, which is a big change in the way we do things. Uh, we'll skip Fab Labs for now. Uh, there's a lot of controversies around 3D printing. One of the things that we heard about a couple of years ago was this guy had made this 3D printed gun. And oh my god, it's the end of the world because you can print a gun in your house and that changes everything. Except it doesn't change anything because you can always make a gun in your house with a piece of copper pipe. Uh, but more than that, this is a really, really bad gun. Right? A plastic gun that's made out of this really wimpy material, right? what do you think happens when you fire it? <laughs> it explodes in your hand, uh, and that's a really bad thing. Uh, guns are a mature market. Guns are a mature uh, object. You don't need a 3D printer to make a gun. You need a street corner. Right? So that's not really an issue, even though uh, the media tends to make it out to be an issue. Uh, this is an issue, uh, because this is happening more and more, uh, 3D printing of biomaterials. Uh, holds great possibility for amazing new inventions in uh, in healthcare and medicine, three D printing organs for transplant, all that wonderful stuff. But if my doctor can three D print biomaterials, then so can the terrorist next door, right? And then he's three D printing biotoxins and chemical weapons, and then what happens, right? So there's problems there as well. Uh, what about information ownership? What happens if I can take the design of an object that is associated with a company? Uh, and is basically tied up in the money-making possibilities of that company, and anybody can make one. 
that changes the way information ownership happens for one way or another, right? You think about Coke bottles. They're, they're designed, the design of the Coke bottle is um, protected under many different kinds of information ownership and it is iconic. If you tried to buy an object that was like that, it would be, you would assume that it was Coke. And there's all sorts of issues around that as well. Design patents and all sorts of stuff there. Uh, and we already talked about econ economics and industry and how if you had a machine in your house, uh, this is the sort of the future people imagine with 3D printing, right? You've got your kitchen and you've got your dishwasher and then beside your dishwasher you've got your manufacturing machine, right? And you download a plan from the internet and you put it in there and then out comes a new set of silverware or a new pair of shoes or whatever you need. And that changes everything about the way that the economy is set up right now. All right, so... 3D printing is still in its infancy, especially um, sort of consumer-grade 3D printing. Uh, 3D printing has been going on in industries for a long time. There are four basic kinds of 3D printing. Uh, some of them are messy and difficult. Some of them are easy and consumer-grade already. Uh, selective laser sintering is one of the better uh, 3D printing models. This is a uh, little boat that was made with nylon selective laser sintering. Uh, really high detail. The way this works is you've got a big bed of nylon powder and you fire a laser beam at it and then that fuses the nylon powder together and you can make flexible materials and all sorts of stuff. It's expensive and it's really, really messy because by the time you're done uh, a print run, what you've got is basically a big block of nylon powder with your 3D printed stuff in it somewhere and you have to pull it apart and the nylon powder goes everywhere. It's terrible. So that is likely to remain an industry kind of 3D printing rather than a consumer kind of 3D printing. Fused deposition modeling, uh, FDM, or some say fused film and fabrication, that's this stuff. That's the kind of thermoplastics that you melt and then lay out layer by layer. There's also stereolithography, which is becoming more popular. This is where you have a bed of liquid uh, acrylic resin, and you fire an uh, ultraviolet light or a laser beam at it, and it cures. Uh, if anybody has uh, acrylic nails or gel nails, is the same kind of material, except that you can selectively fuse and solidify the uh, acrylic resin. Uh, and then you have what we traditionally would call 3D printing would be uh, actually uh, powder, what do we call this, powder bed blue jet printing. This is 3D printing proper. This is where you have like a print head, like an inkjet print head that, it, that it emits glue and then powdered metal. And then you can build up a, a sort of a matrix of glue and powdered metal. And then you take that and you, uh, get rid of the glue and add copper into it and then, and then anneal it and then you get a metal 3D printed part. Very cool technology. Uh, but for now, this is the one that is mostly commercially available. Uh, the stereolithography also exists as well. Uh, we talked already a lot about what FDM looks like. Uh, that's this plastic stuff. And it's good, but it's not great. There's two primary materials that people use in, F in uh, FDM, uh, PLA and ABS. PLA is polylactic acid. That's the stuff that you guys are using, I think, in the library. Uh, it's organic, and it's made from corn, and it's biodegradable, and it's all sorts of stuff. Uh, the acrylo, what is this? Acrylonitrile butadiene, but, sorry, acrylonitrile butadiene styrene. Uh, Lego. <laughs> right, it sounds terrible, but it's Lego, and it's great, great stuff. Uh, so these two different, different kinds of plastics, and they work well, but FDM works with any thermoplastic, and a thermoplastic is just a thing that can be melted with heat. Chocolate is a thermoplastic, and you can have a chocolate 3D printer, which is kind of fun. Um, all right, so here's what they look like. This is an SLS machine, millions of dollars, not right for human consumption. This is consumer uh, stereolithography machine, uh, this liquid acrylic resin stuff, getting cheaper and really, really cool technology. This is consumer FDM, like when we have in the library. And then uh, there's the, uh, I don't have a picture of the inkjet one because that one's really big and messy. All right, so that's the machines that can make 3D printing. How do we actually get a model that we can use to send it to the printer to make a thing, right? I've got all this stuff that I've made, but all of this stuff needs a computer model. Uh, so the kinds of ways we get computer models, and put this stuff here, we can look at this stuff afterwards. The way you get a computer model is you either make it yourself, uh, or you download it from somebody else. You may have basically a 3D copy machine. 3D scanning is used in the context where you need to have a very accurate representation of your object because you're going to mate it with something in the real world. Dentists use 3D scanning to make crowns. Uh, this guy did an art project 3D scanning, really cool thing. He had a, there was a chip out of a piece, out of a brick in a wall, 
and he 3D scanned the, um, the sort of impact point, and then he made an object that looked, made it look like Lego, and then he glued it in place. It was really kind of neat. So 3D scanning is great, difficult, but good. Protractor, and you just measure it bit by bit by bit, and you replicate a model by hand. Uh, the other way to do that is in by downloading a model that somebody else has made. So Thingiverse is the place we do that with. There's lots of websites around where you can download a model that somebody else made. Um, and these people made the model in exactly the same way. They either 3D print, 3D scanned it, or they caliper measured it, or sometimes they wrote a piece of code to build a model algorithmically or parametrically. Uh, so I wanted to give a couple examples of how to build models. Uh, and I wanted to use origami as an example. It's a popular example because we can sort of relate to what these things are. They're three-dimensional, uh, but they're made of sort of two-dimensional surfaces, flat things. Uh, my origami model that I'm going to build for you today, once we get into modeling, is this box. Uh, this is a really cute little thing that you can build. Yeah, here, box. Ooh. Uh, I got a few more. Not everybody can have a box. Boxes for everybody. <laughs> uh, and these boxes are very easy to make, but they're... Uh, very specifically three-dimensional object. So if you want to model something like this, we have to think about what it's going to look like and how it's going to go. So I'm going to keep this one so we can model it together ourselves. Lots of 3D modeling software out there. Tinkercad, Blender, SketchUp, ZBrush, ZBrush, uh, and MechSmisher. There's lots of different uses for each of these things. SketchUp is the one that I use primarily because it's free uh, and it's relatively easy to start working with. 